Coming up on SBS On Demand on October 28th is a 30-minute documentary all about Lifeline, uh, a film called Always Listening. And it's my great pleasure to have the director of Always Listening uh, speaking to me now, Genevieve Bailey. Genevieve, welcome to Movie Metropolis. Thanks, Peter. Thanks for having me. Now, this is uh, such a, a compact and intriguing documentary about such an important part of our mental health um, system, um, which, of course, is Lifeline. How did this documentary come about? Yeah, well, my last uh, feature documentary, Happy Sad Man, explores the lives of five very different men and their emotional landscape and mental health journeys. And so through the amazing experience of releasing Happy Sad Man and screening it around Australia, I met a lot of people, um, people who with lived experience of mental health challenges or family or loved ones they might have lost or people working in the space. And Lifeline was one of the organisations that was screening Happy Sad Man for their for their crisis supporters. So when I was speaking with Lifeline and thinking about the actual idea of what crisis support workers do, I thought, well, I don't really have an idea of what these people look like or who they are or what walks of life they come from. And I thought that's a really missing piece. Uh, I thought it would be fascinating to get behind the lens and um, explore Lifeline um, in a way. We know the service is available 24-7 and it's a, it's a name many Australians or most Australians would have heard of, but who are these people picking up these calls 24 hours, seven days a week? That's what I was very intrigued by. You, you've uh, talked to some uh, interesting people, uh, um, obviously with their own backgrounds, with mental health or whatever, and uh, or wanting to help people with mental health issues. Um, was it easy for them uh, and for you to get them to talk to camera and to be interviewed? Yeah, it's interesting. People are, often ask me that because I've, um, yeah, I've made films with with really young people and with people with really challenging experiences that they share on camera. And people often ask, "How do I make? Or were they comfortable? How did you make them comfortable?" And I, I sort of see that as the most important part of my job. So yes, I want the films to look great and sound great and be interesting and dynamic. But the most important thing for me as a director and a producer is to make sure whoever's in front of my camera is really comfortable and feels really safe because I think. Any time we're interviewed or even photographed, if it's at a barbecue or anything, even if it's just a social event, if you don't feel comfortable, you don't really look like yourself or, or sound like yourself. So for me, the biggest compliment as a filmmaker is when people say that they are really happy um, with how they are portrayed in a film because they say it really looks and sounds like me or when an audience member says that the film feels really authentic. For me, that's what I'm striving to do is, is to make work that really is... Um, yeah, very honest and very candid and very, um, yeah, makes you feel like you're, you're with those people in a very authentic way. Well, they they speak very naturally and uh, they're very open about their situation and we get quite an insight uh, into uh, how Lifeline operates. Um, was it always uh, the intention for it to be a 30-minute uh, documentary? The intention was actually for it to be shorter, Peter, for it to be around 15 minutes. But I, I quickly realised there was no way we were going to be able to um, pack in, um, you know, so much information because Lifeline has such a rich history being um, uh, began here 61 years ago now in Australia and um, in Sydney by Sir Ellen Walker, who is featured in an archive interview in the film. And learning about the history of Lifeline in itself could have been a whole whole film. But I also wanted to bring it to the current day and show how Lifeline is responding to, uh, you know, current crises, whether it's cost of living, whether it's floods, whether it's bushfire affected people, or whether it's people who are having a really difficult week and actually have no one they feel they can speak to. So I wanted to really give the audience an opportunity to see where it came from, where it is now, and especially to also show from someone um, who's used Lifeline as a service and counts them for saving her life. So. We have very generous people in the film sharing these very intimate stories and I feel really grateful and honoured that they've um, participated. Yes, because there's still, uh, I, I know it, it's uh, crumbling, but there's still a stigma about uh, disclosing mental health and I suppose um, Lifeline and, and, uh, and people who perhaps want to commit suicide or whatever and, and have nowhere to turn, Lifeline offers that opportunity um, in a more, 
I don't know, objective and and remote sort of way without it being too personal. Yeah, because it's an anonymous service, that's a really important part for a lot of people, you know, who who might not want to speak to someone, might not want to go and talk to a GP or talk to a friend or colleague. So it is an anonymous service and that's also why um, making the film, I was really mindful that it was a special opportunity to sort of capture um, the position of someone who's answering those calls or those texts because people now can reach out to Lifeline via their phone text or web chat. Web chat. Um, so that was really interesting as well to learn that there are some people who would just never call. They would not want to speak on the phone, but the opportunity to text feels safer for them. Maybe it's logistically safer as well. They might be living in a family violence situation where they just don't have the privacy to call. Mm. So I learned a lot about um, not just the work that they've done in the past, but how they're, you know, growing and developing to accommodate people, you know, every year in the best way they can. And I think that's a really interesting way to think about the fact that that text is a is an opportunity to bring in a whole uh, another cohort of people who perhaps would never have, have, have picked up the phone and called Lifeline. Yes, yes, exactly. And and the trained people, because they uh, people have to be trained to be part of Lifeline, uh, is quite a an extensive process by the looks of it. Yeah, and they um they did mention in the making of the film um that a number of volunteers who sign up to do the training um don't make it through the end of the training, which is absolutely fine. And that's the reason is because they don't want people doing um this sort of work, this sort of roles um if if it's not suited to them, and, and that's completely understandable because it is it is really difficult, it is really challenging, mm. and I think you know hats off to all the people who have committed to doing this for six months or a year, and also. As we touch on in the film, there's some people who have been volunteering for over 40 years. There's a, a gentleman by the name of Ken White who started um, volunteering after going through a divorce and he would uh, drive in and volunteer at the uh, Pitt Street Centre in Sydney. And he's been doing it ever since and this is his 41st year of service, which is extraordinary. He drives over two hours each way to reach the call centre. So, yeah, it's quite amazing um, to learn a bit about the people and why they are doing this sort of crisis support work and, and what, what led them there and, yeah, what keeps them there. It's very inspiring. And I sometimes feel like what we see in the media is amplifying the stories of people doing horrible things, which is important, obviously, in the world to understand what's happening and why and, and who the perpetrators are. But opportunity to make always listening was to really amplify and spotlight these stories of people who are doing really generous, courageous and um, very, very critical work. Yes, yes. And you certainly reveal um, uh, in terms of phone, uh, uh, people phoning in and being uh, the people in Lifeline being able to listen carefully and to understand and to respond appropriately and also those who text in uh, to read between the lines, perhaps, uh, in terms of the messages that they receive and also respond appropriately. Yeah, definitely. That was one of my favourite parts of making the film, actually, Peter, was exploring this idea of listening. How do we listen? It's something that maybe we all think we're capable of doing, but some of the people in the film explained that it's actually a skill that can be learnt and actively listening and deeply listening is very different from just, hi, how are you going? Yeah, good. How's your weekend? Fine. Like we have these sort of automatic responses, but to actually sit and listen, let alone to someone who's going through a crisis, is, is very, very um, challenging. And it is a skill that people can learn, so it might come more naturally to some. But I thought that was really inspiring to learn about that idea that one of the women in the film, Trina, said, I always thought I was good at listening. And then she did the lifeline training and she reflected on, ah, oh, I would not have listened like this five years ago. This is a really different way of listening because Australians are very conversational, you know, often very chatty and very, um, one of the women in the film talks of looking for commonality between us. But actually when someone's going through a crisis, sometimes the most important thing is to not offer your opinion, not provide solutions, for example, but just to actually listen and make the person feel very heard and very safe. So there's a big difference there. And that was one of my favourite parts was sort of exploring that idea. And the title of the film, Always Listening, sort of is a nod as well to the fact that Lifeline is available 24-7, 365 days a year, that it's uh, it's never closed. Yeah, exactly. That, that's a, a lifeline, an opportunity um, for 
people to uh, get support. Um, and uh, I notice how diverse um, Lifeline has has been over the years, including, of course, dealing with First Nations uh, issues, cultural issues, and uh, and of course, you know, issues related to floods and fire and to uh, economic circumstances and so on. So, uh, people who work in Lifeline have to deal with potentially a whole range of issues. Absolutely. And some of those big ones that we think of of Lifeline is someone who might be in a position where they're wanting to end their life. And there are definitely callers who are in that situation. But what I learned is there's also people who are going through experiences of perhaps being bullied at work or recently lost a loved one or has a cancer diagnosis and no support from family or you know, there's different situations. And I think crisis is different for everyone. And a lot of the time I think people might be discouraged from reaching out for help because they think, well, it's not that bad. There's someone worse off and they don't want to sort of take up time or resources. And I think it's really great to um, remember that when you watch the film, you can see that those people who are picking up those calls or those texts, I really liked showing them on camera and seeing that they're actually people that look really easy to talk to <laughs> and are really kind and not non-judgmental. That's a big part of taking these calls for help and not being judgmental, not saying, oh, what did you do that for? Or, oh, you should have done this. So, yeah, I think it's um, hopefully a film that people will watch and um, will remove some of the mystery around this service and see these people and hear them speak and think, well, I could, I could call them and I could feel comfortable to share my story. Yes, exactly. Um, anonymous and, uh, uh, and helpful, um, but, of course, not solving problems because then you can't you can't just uh, solve a, an issue like that um as you mentioned already the uh and as i was impressed to see the history over 60 years that uh lifeline yeah. has been going and i was impressed too with archival footage and just understanding how this uh service this facility has been around for so long and how it's evolved yeah definitely i think the archive footage i've watched it so many times now it still gets me every time. It's very moving. There's an interview with Sir Alan Walker who founded Lifeline and it began, you know, to put it simply because he had an experience where someone had reached out to him um, who wanted to end their life and he was very passionately wanting to help this person and this person did end their life and he thought we've got to do something about this. So I think it's really amazing to think that one person had an idea which started small but was potential to have huge impact and that it's continued on for all these decades. And I was very moved when we first screened the film for the people involved because I took a little moment and reflected on not only their stories and their journey, but the literally millions of people who have accessed this service over the years and the thousands of people who have provided this service. So I think it's, yeah, it's very timely to acknowledge that um, it's it's been a huge commitment for a lot of people um, to keep this service going. Absolutely. And, and always an issue, of course, is funding. Um, yeah. and, and that's touched on as well, that uh, uh, it needs to be funded to be able to continue because uh, it's so important. Yeah, when people in crisis, you know, it's to call and be told to call back next week or to have a chat with someone in two weeks or make an appointment in four weeks, it, it, does, it doesn't, yeah, it's, it's not what any of us want. So, yeah. Yeah. Now, okay, 30-minute documentary. Lots of yes. footage you would have shot uh, uh, as part of this film. What was the editing process like? <laughs> yeah, the editing process was really fun, actually. I worked with a wonderful editor, Danielle Bosenberg, who's based in Sydney. And um, it was really, really great. I'd worked on an ABC Kids show before with Danielle called The Funny Ones. And I really love um, collaborating with her. She's very good at what she does. She's a very clear communicator. And we both have quite... Um, I guess I don't know how to put it, like quite playful personalities and so we don't get too sort of bogged down on, on um, being too stubborn about certain ideas. So our dialogue between us back and forth was really great. I was able to work um, partly in person with her in the edit suite and partly remotely and then I did some editing um, myself as well. Um, but, yeah, it was great. I really wanted to, like I said, capture some of the history but bring us to now and also show us a range of locations across Australia because there are people all over Australia who are providing this service. Um, so one of my favourite shoots was going out to a dairy farm outside of Coffs Harbour to meet Michelle, who is a lifeline um, text support. When I say text, I've got to pronounce it properly, not tech, but text as in 
chat, um, web chat. So that was great, um, arriving at her farm and seeing all her beautiful animals. There's always so many animals in a Genevieve Bailey film, my brother always says. But, um, yeah, she she actually shared that um, she's always admired Lifeline, but she would never want to um, be on the phones because she doesn't like talking on the phone at the best of times. So that was interesting learning that during COVID when there was a call out for people who could do text chat. She was able to offer that service from home, from her farm. So she committed to the night shifts and then would get up early in the morning and do her farm work. So that was really amazing. And so the editing process, I could make a whole film about Michelle, for example, in 30 minutes. But um, that's part of the that's part of the art really is to condense these stories and um, and the editing process. I would say was really smooth for this film. Actually, it was yeah, it went it went really well. Okay, okay, and I can imagine that this uh, your documentary uh, always listening would be shown to government and to other people who have uh, who run the purse strings, if you like, uh, just to make sure that uh, yeah. Lifeline continues. Yeah, I'm really passionate about the capacity that documentaries have or films have to create really positive social impact and, and positive change. And sometimes the people who are making those decisions about funding or services um, are obviously working in a certain capacity. And to stop and sit and watch a film, whether it's half an hour or an hour and a half, and really show the stories in a um, very direct, intimate way, I think amazing things, and we know amazing things can happen um, with so many Australian documentary filmmakers and documentary filmmakers around the world who are making films now that have really huge impact goals um, that they reach. So definitely want this film to, um, yeah, to be screened and, and has already screened. Um, we took it to Canberra um, and screened uh, there for, for people, um, which was, yeah, it was very moving actually to see, see the responses there. Yeah, oh, that's terrific, and and I suppose the people who are part of the film who have now seen it, uh, documentary, how have they responded? Oh, it was really heartwarming, Peter. That was one of my favourite moments. Is um, we had a, a special screening at a cinema a, in Sydney, and almost everyone, not everyone was there, but almost everyone from the film was there, a number of guests and supporters of Lifeline, and. We had a reception afterwards and food and drinks, and it was just like the warmest um, reception. People were really proud to be in it. And like I said, that's, for me, a great achievement to know the people involved, um, whether that's the CEO of Lifeline, whether that's a volunteer, um, we're all really proud of the work that we created together. So that was, yeah, it was a very memorable and very fun night. I, I still think about how special those moments are to come together. Yes, yes. Oh, well done and, and terrific. And uh, it's great that uh, your film, uh, Always Listening, is so accessible because it was on SBS and from October 28th on SBS On Demand. Yeah, that's right. So we had a broadcast on the SBS main channel October 28th and then a um, yeah, SBS On Demand so people can tune in and watch it any time uh, of the day, just like Lifeline 24-7 available on SBS On Demand, which we're really yeah, excited about. Okay. And I still have fond memories, uh, Genevieve, of I Am Eleven, which was uh, such an insightful uh, documentary. And uh, you've mentioned yes. Happy Sad Man. So you choose some very humane topics for your films. Yeah, interestingly, I saw one of my 11-year-olds, who's no longer 11, obviously, anymore on the weekend. And um, because the film was shot in 15 countries with 11-year-olds in 12 languages, they're all over the world. And I still call them my kids and I'm still in touch with many of them. So some weeks I might be in touch with five of them, which is really fun to see what they're doing now and they've finished school and finished university and some of them are married, some of them have children now. So it's um it's been interesting along the way to develop and strengthen these ties and also to continue filming so that I can create a sequel, which I know a lot of people who watch I Am 11 have said, will there be a sequel? And I say, yes, there will be. So yeah, that's been one of the greatest joys of my career, definitely, has been making I Am 11. It's been very, yeah, very moving and very powerful. Yes, yes. And uh, on that note, are you working on another film at the moment? Yeah, well, we just, um, the fun thing about a broadcast is we finished the film so close to the broadcast date. So we've just finished it now and um, we've got a couple of other things in development. But, yeah, the sequel for I Am 11 is something that I'm, yeah, probably most excited about at the moment and um, have been doing some remote interviews with the kids overseas. And, yeah, so I'm really looking forward to being able to 
continue that and, and share that with audiences because we have we have a network of people all over the world who have seen I'm 11 now we we screened in over 50 countries and different languages so it's it's really special to be able to keep in touch with not just the people from the film but with audiences around the world uh, excellent stuff and uh, certainly uh, always listening um, is uh, on SBS and uh, dealing with the um, history of Lifeline and the the issue of uh, people who need mental health support or, or need some sort of uh, uh, opportunity to talk through their uh, difficult issues. And we've been speaking to the director of Always Listening, Genevieve Bailey. Genevieve, thank you so much for talking with me. Thank you, Peter. Have a good week. You too. All the best. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.